Welcome to the Uplift. We've got a great show for you today. A great cast of characters as well. Among them, a pilot flying around the world, and he's trying to set a record doing it. What is that record? We'll tell you. Plus, a librarian who saved items left behind in books, and now those forgotten artifacts have become something even bigger in and of themselves. Also, a group of baseball players who live where and with who? We'll show you. And an equestrian who overcame the odds. We're talking big odds thanks to an unlikely horse. Plus, the heartwarming videos you just have to see. You're watching The Uplift. Hey there, welcome to The Uplift, the show that lifts you up for at least the next 30 minutes, you and me both. I'm Tony DeCopo. We've got a great show for you today. I mean a really great show. We're going to begin by introducing you to Lissa Bachner. She overcame impossible odds to become one of the nation's best and most inspirational equestrians, and her horse became her eyesight. Here's David Begno with the story. Have you ever seen someone on the back of a 1,200 pound horse jump a fence? Well, watch again. Because Lissa Bachner is doing it blind. I do not see this fence at all until right now. How much is getting to a jump and getting over it dependent on the horse taking you there? 98%. Wow. Her left eye is a prosthetic. As for the right eye, what exactly can you see where? I see my finger when it gets here, yep. and then it disappears at here. You see a little bit of light, but again, it's blurry. Mm -hmm. You can't make out quite what it is. Right. You can see color. I see color very well. The minute I see that white fence with flowers and the green, I know I need my outside leg. She invited us to her farm in Wellington, Florida where she even gave me a chance to ride with her. When did you start riding? When I was three. She grew up at an equestrian center in Virginia that her mother owned. She's been a champion rider since the age of five when she was diagnosed with uveitis. That's a rare inflammatory eye disease and it made school difficult. Was childhood lonely for you? No, I had horses. It was her mother who encouraged her to follow her passion and ride. Everything good in my life is because of my mother. My mother knew as much as she wanted to keep me at home and keep me safe, she bought me a horse. Bachner never doubted herself, but her fellow competitors did. They were making fun of my riding, that I should stop. I remember looking away from them because I was crying. That was when I was determined to figure out how to do it and better than anyone else. Enter Milo, an inexperienced horse that Bachner's trainer found in Europe. This horse walked off the trailer and I looked at it and went, yuck. And I looked at this emaciated, mangy creature. Milo needed somebody to believe in him, and Bachner did. Not only did Milo carry her over jumps, he guided her through the countless mental, and emotional obstacles as they traveled the country together, competing and winning. Where was Milo ranked in the country with you? In 2004, uh, we won the country. I get the chills just so, listening to you say that. Well, not only that, now I've got the chills. <laughs> so, we were so in tune with each other, and we went for three months where we didn't lose a class. The pair's extraordinary bond is told in her book, Milo's Eyes. While she was at the top of her game, she says she misunderstood a conversation between her mother and stepfather that led her to think the competitions were costing too much money. So Bachner suddenly sold Milo. I thought I was bleeding everyone dry. I wasn't contributing. It was a lot of money. In hindsight, the decision to sell him was... Worst decision of my life. Because you'd lost more than a champion. You lost... I had lost my best friend. Right. I had lost my savior. But three and a half years later. And I very quietly said, Milo. Really? And if horses could cry, I could feel his body heaving. And of course, I was a mess. And I walked down. I said, I don't understand. 
and my mom said, I bought Milo back for you. I found him, and I bought him back for you. And I looked at her and I said, you, he's mine again? And she said, he's always been yours. Together again, Milo carried Bachner to one more victory. We walked in the ring and they announced us. The entire Coliseum went silent. Wow. And hearing our name together. Mm. And so three classes, 100 people in each class, won every single one. You did? Mm -hmm. On this horse that was now 16, almost 17 years old. That was their last hurrah before Milo died at the age of 17. I knew the moment he was gone because I felt him go through me. It was awful. Nothing will replace Milo. Left here. But Lisa may have found her next best partner. This is a magnetic owned and shown by Alyssa Bachmer. Now, with less than 5% of her eyesight remaining, she's putting her trust in a new horse. She calls Mango. Good job, Lisa. Last month, we were there as she and Mango won first in their class at the World Equestrian Center in Ocala, Florida. Now 49 years old, Lissa Bachner is riding and she's riding with the intention of helping others. To the people who will watch this and say, oh my gosh, I'm inspired by this woman, what would you say? I would tell them I knew myself well enough that, to know that I could not exist without the horses hmm. and that I had to find a way to continue to ride. There are people who don't give up and don't take no for an answer. And I did not do it myself. I had a lot of help. And I have no shame in saying that I asked for help and I got it. I've seen that story twice now and there are new lessons in it each time you watch. All right, to our next story. Cracking open a good book can take you on an adventure, but sometimes it's not what's written on the pages, but what's left behind in the book. That's what Oakland Public Library's Found in a Book Project is all about. Caitlin O'Kane has more. A map of Japan, a crochet hook, a coupon for pizza, and a recipe for success. These are the artifacts collected by the Oakland Public Library. All of the mysterious items were left behind in books, and now they're on display on the library's website. Librarian Sharon McKellar is behind the Found in a Library project. She was inspired by the forgotten mementos she personally found left in books. We put out a call to other library staff just to see if anyone had anything they were willing to share and was just totally inundated with other people's little collections of things they had found. So as soon as I realized um, it wasn't just me who had these things and enjoyed these things, it, it was uh, an easy decision kind of keep it going. More and more artifacts were submitted, and Sharon has added 370 to the library's online collection. But she has a couple hundred left to add. There are definitely some favorites. Anything that's ever created by a kid, I think I love. Uh, there's uh, a drawing of uh, that I call CJ and Dad that's still one of my favorites that has the dad drawn huge as kind of a devil with horns and a tail and a pitchfork and a giant kind of evil grin and then this tiny little drawing it's labeled cj of a little kid with a frown face so i just i really i really love the way kids express themselves both in drawing and writing the project is fairly new but she hopes it inspires people to dive into books at their local library because you never know what you're going to find. One person recognized um, something that they had written, although they themselves had not actually been to an open public library, but they live very nearby, in a city nearby. So they're not sure how it landed here, but imagining that it was a note they had written for somebody else. And another person reached out because one of the sort of love notes looked very much like her parents' handwriting and the kind of notes that they used to leave each other. And her mother and she had looked at it and, and agreed that it very well could have been a note passed between the mom and the dad who had lived here in Oakland um, in the late 80s for a couple of years. So that one's really cool. And it's, you know, it's not a for sure, but it's, um, it's fun to think that you might know who that came from. Whether it's a stellar book review 
a recipe, or a note. Books are filled with mysteries, and each artifact is part of someone's personal history. You just have a sense that, a sense of shared space in a way. So even if you don't know what book this thing came from, even if you aren't the one who found it, you still have a sense that this is a person who is in the same community as me or was in the same is me using the same resources, entering the same spaces. And I think I think part of why people are especially excited about that right now is, you know, we've obviously been through a bit of a disconnecting time with COVID. And um, so it is a way to sort of feel, feel a connection to people who you don't even know through these objects. Just a delightful story there by Caitlin O'Kane, who also happens to be producer of this year's show. Thank you, Caitlin. Coming up, this little boy in the hospital was gonna miss out on summer camp. What surprise did he get in his hospital room that made it all a little bit better? And the sweet surprise this boy got at his lemonade stand that had him overcome with emotion. Plus, the unique place these minor league baseball players live. Stick around. You're watching The Uplift. Pretty good arm there. Welcome back to The Uplift. We've got those heartwarming videos, the ones you just need to see. And we're going to start with a groundhog that has gone viral. A few years ago, a gardener in Delaware noticed someone was eating his vegetables. So he set up a camera and was able to capture these images. The culprit, a brazen groundhog who sat right in front of the camera as he ate those stolen veggies. Jeff eventually found a soft spot in his heart for the groundhog and named him Chunk. Now he's not only le lets Chunk eat the vegetables, I, I, I tell you, but he's also built Chunk a little table. You see it there. Uh, and created an Instagram for Chunk. And if you're doing social media yourself, you'll be galled to discover that Chunk now has more than half a million followers. How about you? I have less. This next little video shows a little boy named Kale. There's Kale, who was very excited to go to summer camp. Uh, just one problem, Kale has cancer and had to stay in the hospital for 30 days straight. Not fun for anyone. So the staff at Little Wishes brought summer camp to Kale, they built a fort for him right there in his hospital room so he could chill as Kale likes to do. The organization is dedicated to bringing joy to kids in the hospital and it seems like they did exactly that for young Kale. Now let's take a look at this next video from Lexi Burke who calls herself a serial tipper. Take a look. Are you trying to raise money for anything? <laughs> Soccer team, but it's a lot of money. Yeah. So my dad wanted me to pay like, at least like, half of it. What position are you? I play center attacking mid. It's well, so good. How much is it? Three dollars. And I play a change. We're gonna give you this. Keep the change. What the? Can I? Thank you so much. What the heck? What the heck? Thank you guys so much. Yeah, it's eleven hundred dollars, and this is raised from tons of people around Nashville what the and around the country to help you out because you're what working so hard. Oh, are you, what do you do? <laughs> We're on TikTok. Oh my god! <laughs> Can I call my dad? Yep. Let's call him. Can you keep it in here? Yes. We'll keep it very safe. Thank you guys so much. Yes. And we want to make sure you get home safe with this too. It's amazing. Lexi said uh, she got together with Nico after his family, uh, or Nico after this video went viral, uh, and he's not only excited to go to soccer camp next year, but also to pay that kind deed forward to others. We're going to have more of our heartwarming videos later in the show, but if you want to see even more, you can head to our Facebook page. That is facebook.com slash uplift news. Coming up, meet minor league baseball players living in an unlikely place with some unlikely friends. Also, a pilot on a remarkable journey all around the world. But there's a catch. He's trying to set a record. What record is that? Find out after the break.
The Uplift is back, and our next video shows nine-year-old Felix, who is excited to share some news with his grandpa. Take a look. What did you do? So, you know I got two home runs, you right? You two jacks. And then my grand slam, uh, I signed the ball for you. Okay. And, and it the says, uh, no. I'll put a date down okay. for you. And it says, Papa, I love you. Why did you do that? Because you've taught me everything about baseball. Oh, honey, honey. That was so sweet. I put it my, I put it right on my, oh, God, that was so good. Wow, honey. Woo! Oh, that's a very sweet story. Now to another story about some other baseball players. Before they make it to the major leagues, if they make it, some minor league players live paycheck to paycheck. A lot of them do, in fact. One team has found an affordable and unexpected option, though. It's a different kind of living situation. Here's CBS Chicago's Charlie DeMar. Life in the minor leagues isn't all big money and glamour, especially when it comes to where you live. A lot of people are in host families, and sometimes I've heard stories they don't have Wi-Fi, TV, air conditioning. Beds, I've heard situations where guys didn't have beds. Beds, it's yeah. some scary stories, man. <laughs> yeah. Ask Chase Dawson and Blake oh, Grant Parks Jersey. chasing big league dreams with the Schaumburg Boomers, and they'll tell you they hit a home run. So long. You guys going up? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. After each game, they come home to the most unlikely place, Friendship Village, a retirement community in the Chicago suburbs. I've got three big boxes of these. Where residents like the vibrant Velma Robinson roam the halls and the greens. Wow. <laughs> Here, it's not just bingo and board games. They just are exciting to talk to mm -hmm. and somebody different. My first re uh, reaction was, really? Yeah. And I was like, you know what, let's do it. Velma's awesome. I couldn't believe he was 95. We got a date next Tuesday with yeah. Velma. For years, Velma's made friends with players younger than her grandkids. You threw out the first pitch, I understand. Yeah. What was that I like did. for you? <laughs> Two or three boomers have spent the last nine seasons here. Any piece of advice that has stuck with you? Keep chasing your dreams. 2-1 to Dawson. Hi, Bingo. Hi. Great story there as well. All right, moving on to our next one. Mac Rutherford is on a solo journey, flying all around the world alone. And if that's not remarkable enough, there is an additional catch. CBS Los Angeles' Michelle Gilly caught up with Mac during a pit stop in Orange County. How was it? Very good, thank you. Yeah, it was a really nice flight. Uh, I was able to fly past the Hollywood sign. The 17-year-old, who has flown practically around the world in his attempt to set a record, got a kick out of passing by the Hollywood sign Monday morning. Mac Rutherford has gone from northern to southern California in the latest leg of the journey, and he made a lunch and fuel stop at Orange County's John Wayne Airport. Welcome to Orange County and John Wayne Airport. Thank you very so much. delighted to have you with us. The teen from Belgium began his quest at the end of March in Bulgaria. In a few weeks, he hopes to complete his circle around the globe and become the youngest solo pilot to ever achieve such a huge endeavor. So I was in Japan, and it's a huge leg towards the U.S., so I had to add extra fuel tanks just for that one stop. Uh, and I did a 10-hour flight over to Atu Island, which is completely uninhabited, not a single person. Uh, but I landed there safely and everything was fine. Mac Rutherford, who comes from a family of aviators and got his license at 15, is flying a European ultralight plane. So far, uh, uh, one of the most harrowing parts of the trip day, was flying through a sandstorm over the, Egypt over the Egyptian desert. desert. This is one of the amazing, most amazing sites ever. After the Orange County pit stop, Rutherford took off for Cabo San Lucas. If all goes as planned, he'll set the Guinness World Record in a few weeks when he lands back in Bulgaria. How do you top this at 17? Uh, well, the, the point is not to topping it. It's just this is something I've really wanted to do, and so I do it. I'll see what the, my next challenge brings me. It might be more challenging, it might be less challenging, but as long as it's what I want to do, I'll be happy. Coming up, you know those giant pumpkins at state fairs that win blue ribbons for being so gigantic? There's one. How do they get that big? We'll take you to one farm where they are growing these giant gourds. And what prompted this reaction from a six-year-old at the hospital? We'll tell you after the break.
Welcoming home a new baby is exciting for the whole family, but take a look at how 12-year-old Brayden and 6-year-old Braxton reacted to their new baby brother. <gasps> Your hands are cold, okay? AJ! It's okay. <laughs> Come go see him. Oh, <laughs> state fairs. They often have contests for those giant pumpkins. But what goes into growing something that big? CBS Minnesota's Marielle Mose shows us. Hey, happy girl. Pumpkins bigger than a baby and still growing sit in this garden inside the Arboretum. This big pumpkin over here behind me is Audrey and the smaller one next to me is Seymour. This little shop of horticulture is a first time project for Annie Claude and her team at U of M Extension. One plant takes about 500 square feet on average and you just produce one giant pumpkin from each plant. All the green that you're seeing is actually just two vines, one for each pumpkin. And these vines are vital for getting water from the ground to the pumpkin. And all the water is what makes them get so big so quickly. So they're able to just pump all of that water into that one pumpkin. So they're growing about 20 pounds a day right now. Claude learned tricks along the way, like burying the vines for more moisture and giving the pumpkins shade to keep their skin soft so they grow even bigger. But she did run into one hurdle. Last week, insects started infecting the vines, which can kill the pumpkins if it's not dealt with. Our team was out here with our intern Noah cutting little incisions in the vines, doing open vine surgery and taking those little worms out and then patching the vines back up. And they survived it. They're doing great. Audrey already weighs 230 pounds and Seymour is just over 100 pounds. With Audrey's growth in the lead, she's going to compete first. Audrey is destined for the state fair, so we're going to submit her and she should be about 500 to 600 pounds by then if everything goes well. Gaining 20 pounds a day does sound like a jolly good time. And speaking of a jolly good time, that is our show. I hope it brightened your day and lifted you up. I'm confident it did, but you know what I always say. If you want to try again, reruns are free. We'll see you next time on The Uplift.